Yes, people, welcome to our end of year Q&A. My name is Jamie Bourne, and before we get going, just a quick reminder that all our episodes are available on YouTube, Apple and Spotify podcasts, Podbean and Amazon Music. If you're not done so already, there is a part one to our end of year show where me and the team determined our 2020 award winners, so make sure you check that out. If you subscribe to the channel, we never miss an episode, so hit that big red button. Today we are doing a Q&A, and thanks to everyone who sent their questions in, but helping me answer them is a couple new faces to the channel, but integral parts of the team, so let's meet them. Firstly, making his debut, Billy Marsden. How are we, Billy? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, mate. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, mate. Next up, Michael Joyce. How are you, Michael? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, Jamie. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, all good, thanks, buddy. Good to have you on. Yeah. And uh, lastly, but not least, Charlie Griffiths. How are you, Charlie? Yeah, very well. Good to, good to be back again. Looking forward to seeing what questions get thrown up. Exactly. Thanks to everyone that sent them in. We're going to try and get through as many as we can. Um, as we go through them, you'll see we sort of structured them into sort of categories. We had a lot of Canelo questions, a lot of USIC questions, so we sort of bundled them together. Um, but we're going to jump straight in. I've randomised the order, so all of you will answer the question first at a different stage. But the first up is Canelo versus Spence. Can it be made and how does it go? Charlie, you're up first to answer this one, mate. What are your thoughts? Um, on the can it be made, uh, I suppose we've seen weirder matchups made in boxing, um, fights we thought had less chance of being made, get made. So I guess the, the short answer to can it be made is, is yes, anything can get made for the right money. And, um, so long as sort of both, both fighters won it, um, was, was the second part of it. How does it end? It was just basically, how does it go? Yeah, how does the fight unfold? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, I think, I think if it got made, um, I, I don't think, I don't think any any boxer. Just to sort of elaborate a little bit on the can it be made? I don't think any boxer will be, um, you know, necessarily really, really pushing for that fight. I don't think either, um, either particularly need it. Uh, they've both got their own fish to fry in, in a lot of different divisions, and and I just don't see that one necessarily being pushed for. Um, certainly not yet anyway, but if it did and, and for some, for whatever reason, I, I think it would, it would end, it would end very, very one-sided for the bigger man, um, in Canelo. Um, I mean, I like Spence a lot and his performance against Danny Garcia coming back from what he came back from sort of made me respect him even more than I already did. But, um, yeah, I, I think, I think the obvious would be that Canelo is, would be far too big and, and um and just that sort of elite levelness of Canelo as well, which Spence may be on, but but the size difference would would just make it um, a bit a bit Errol Spence, Mikey Garcia in a way, you know, where where one ends up looking not so elite, but just simply due to the size. Yeah, uh, Michael, you're up next. Do you agree with that, or you got a different opinion? Uh, yeah, no, I think it's difficult to disagree. I think um, Canelo at the moment is. You know, he's he's kind of moving into that sort of uh, Mayweather-esque sort of, you know, uh, that's so where everyone kind of wants the big money fight. Um, Spence jumping up two weights, if he was to take the fight, you know, I mean, it's a big ask. It's a big ask. I mean, Spence's punch output, maybe the southpaw stance may cause Canelo, you know, an issue for a, a round or two. But yeah, ultimately, you would have to fancy Canelo, you know, being the bigger, stronger man, probably... Uh, yeah, would win quite comfortably in the end. Yeah, what about for you, Billy? Do you agree? Yeah, I agree completely with the lads there. Uh, I don't really want to see it, to be honest. I'm not interested in Spencer Canelo fighting. And that's if he's got to move up two weights, and that's if Canelo can even get back down to middleweight, which nobody knows if he can or not. And I see it as a one-sided fight, pretty similar to the Garcia fight. And like um, Charlie said, I can see it ending maybe between five and seven rounds, pretty badly for Spence, to be honest. Yeah, I have no interest in watching that at all. Yeah, I agree with all your thoughts. Um, the part of it, can it be made? I do think it can be. Um, Canelo's moved into becoming his own free agent now, so he can sort of do what he wants. And if the money's there, I'm sure he'd take it. But it just doesn't go down well for the smaller man. Um, if you're a smaller guy going up, if you're fighting someone that's not as good as you, you can get away with it. But when you're fighting someone that's even better than you, that just doesn't end well, does it? So it uh, can be made. And I think we all agree that it's pretty one-sided for Canelo. The, uh, the second question is also Canelo-based, and it's after Canelo versus Smith. 
and people are wondering which 168 do we feel has the best chance of beating him. So not necessarily do we think anyone beats him, but who can win the most rounds off him, who gives him the best fight. Um, this one's coming up to you first, Billy. Yeah, um, well, like you just said, Jeremy, I don't think anyone does beat him at that way. But um, I give Plant the best chance of beating him. Um, it's slick, any it, Plant? I mean, I think he could take a few rounds off Canelo. But the only problem with Plant is gas is late in the fight. And I think he could get stopped later on. But I, th I think he's out the out the group, the one most likely to beat Canelo. But like I say, I think he could get stopped later on. Uh, that's unless it proves his fitness, but I think even if he has, he gets stopped late on. I don't think anyone beats him at that weight. I think he's un unbeatable at that weight now, to be honest. Yeah. What about you, Michael? Do you agree? Uh, yeah, Plant um, is definitely one of the top candidates. I mean, a year or two ago, I maybe would have said Billy Joe Saunders because of his sort of awkward style, technique, you know, the, the, the defensive angles that he'd show Canelo. But I think that time's kind of gone now for Saunders. Um, I feel like, yeah. Uh, the inactivity would is ultimately going to hurt Saunders. Um, so yeah, I think Plant maybe uh, the Charlo if he was to go up to one six eight. I know I saw something on a boxing scene the other day where he mentioned you know for Canelo I got to one six eight. So that fight kind of kind of intrigued me. I think uh, maybe Charlo would 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 uh, would possibly be a good shout. So I think maybe yeah I'll go with Charlo or or Plant really. Yeah, just follow on from what you said. I, um, I've i actually said that Plant and Charlo are probably the two that can win the most rounds off him. Um, I think against Canelo, his criticism, similar to what you said about Plant, Billy, is that he can gas a little bit. Um, and in his last two fights against Kovalev and Smith, where he's been on the front foot, he's not gassed because he hasn't had to expend as much energy because he's the one in control. But when he has to fight backwards against a Golovkin or even in some of his other fights, he tires a little bit more and he takes his foot off a little bit. Even against Jacobs, when he kind of wasn't taking centre ring, he tired a little bit. Um, so to be able to take centre ring against him and tire him out, I think uh, Plant and Charlo both have good jabs, which will keep him busy for a round or two. Um, Charlo's got respectable enough power as well in the right hand to land it and I think he can gain respect but my thing is that I just don't think you can win seven clear rounds against Canelo to beat him um, and I don't think anyone at 168 can do that I know a lot of people seem to think that movement something he struggles with and the southpaw a couple of years ago he did but this isn't the same Canelo that fought at 154 or 160 and was sort of boiled down to the weight he's much healthier at this weight and I think he beat Smith and Andrade the southpaws quite easily I think it's the ones with the good jabs and the good fundamentals that can win a couple of rounds off him but just ultimately not win enough and um, so my picks are sort of plant Charlo to win a couple of rounds off him what about you Charlie to finish off yeah, I think I think you guys have gone for for the obvious and plants and Charlos and and I I, I wouldn't necessarily want to see Charlo take on Canelo straight away at one six eight. I'd like to see how um, how he sort of fared against against. I, I I put him in with other fighters of of the sort of level just below Canelo first, but um, yeah, I, I I used to think Saunders would give would give a good fight, but I just I just feel now the the confident sort of. Um, as you say, no longer boiled down. Canelo just just walks through Saunders now. You know, he just wouldn't respect the power at all. And and yeah, Saunders can be slick and could maybe make Canelo miss a few times. But I think once he took a took any shot of Saunders, he'd realised that there was nothing really to fear. So so I feel I feel like the slickness part of Saunders could still make for an intriguing sort of early early couple of rounds, but. A bit like a bit like when when Brook got in with Golovkin. As much as Brook was landing some some nice stuff, you soon realised that Golovkin just just didn't didn't respect the power at all, and, and realised that he didn't need to box him. He could just just walk through him in the end. And I feel like that would that's what would happen to Saunders. So so yeah, probably Plant. But like most of you said, I, I I don't see anyone really troubling him at one six eight at the minute. Okay, well, since we don't see anyone troubling him at 168, the final question on Kalois, question number three, is uh, would Arta Baterviev at 175 be a step too far for Canelo? I know in our first part of our end of year show, when we did our free fights for 2021, we all mentioned it. We've all been talking about it in the group chat. Um, this is coming up to you first, Michael. What do you think? Do you think Baterviev would be a step too far? Um, I don't know if it's a step too far, um, simply because 
Canelo's sort of upper body movement, his speed, um, things like that. And Baturbiev against Grozvik was taking some shots. You know, he's just a machine who just continues to come forward. And yeah, he <laughs> it doesn't stop. I mean, his KO record speaks for itself. Um, I don't see... I mean, Canelo's also got a granite chin, as we saw some of the bombs that GGG landed. And, well, he just pretty much walked through him and smiled and, you know... Um, so I'm not sure if, you know, a stoppage is a thing that you'd be able to get Canelo with as well. Um, I don't see him being outclassed by Baturbiev or, or, you know, Canelo necessarily outclassed by Baturbiev. But, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, that's uh, one of the, definitely one of the fights to make in world boxing, 100%. A um, little bit on the fence here, to be honest with you. But um, I, don't, I don't think it's a step too far for Canelo at all. I, I think he'd be more than hold his own. Um, it's just if he can sort of, you know, back up the machine and the beast that is Baturbiev, to be honest with you. Yeah, that's the the factor against Baturbiev is just that his his punches have an accumulative effect. Um, but he is very, he is beatable if you take away the power. Um, he can be outboxed. And I think Canelo, if he was a natural size, could box the ears off him. Um, I even think if he goes up to 175, you'll see him during the early stages, you'll see him outbox him quite comfortably. It's just whether those shots as they continuously land, because Baturbiev does a lot of subtle things very good. He kind of hits you sort of around the side and to the body without you knowing. But like you said, Vozdik was, you know, some people have Baturbiev ahead, some people have Vozdik ahead. The thing with Vozdik was the second he felt the power, he looked scared. And from minute one, he was really nervous and putting a lot of energy into just avoiding being hit. But I don't think Canelo would. I think Canelo would be a lot more relaxed. Um, and also, Canelo being on the back foot against Baturbiev would worry me a little bit um, in terms of just his engine, because Baturbiev's engine is ridiculous. So it's just whether he could keep up. But I don't think it's a step too far. I think you either see Canelo win um, or you see him lose just to the bigger man. I don't think it's a step too far. Like, he'll get blown away. Um, you know, we're talking about Spence going up to fight Canelo at 160 or whatever. I don't think it'd be that one-sided, even if Baturbiev does win. So I wouldn't say it's a step too far necessarily. But uh, Billy, you're up next. What are your thoughts on it? I know it's in your list for fights for 2021. Yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love to see that fight. I mean, I don't think it's a step too far at all. Uh, I think it's a 50-50, 60-40 fight. Uh, in better, better BS further. I mean... Like you said, Canelo's chin is granite in it. I mean, I think most most heavyweights have struggled to knock him out. Um, but better be his right hand. It's just wicked in it and it keeps coming on, mate. And he's got a nasty body shot on him as well. Um, I, like, I like to say, I'm sitting on the fence as well. I, I don't know which way I'd go, but it's definitely not a step too far. Uh, I think it's a cracking fight. Maybe he edged towards bit of, bit of to mm-hmm. be him. Better be his. But... Um, yeah, I think he could maybe stop Canelo late, but like I said, who knows? I don't know. Yeah, it's a testament to how good Canelo is that we're talking about him like this. And Charlie, you're last up. What are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's a step too far? Yeah, um, I feel like. I feel like when I first uh, when I first sort of thought of it, I did feel I did feel he was um, it was going to be a step too far for him. Um, and then the more the more I sort of I sort of watch of both and 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 what both are almost becoming, um, you just feel it as all the ingredients for just for just a special special fight. You know, the, the, as you say, Jamie, I feel I feel Canelo does does box ears off him if if the size isn't too much and, and you're sort of now thing seven rounds off him. And, and I don't see Baturbi of necessarily winning seven rounds off him. And, and I feel it would be really, really interesting to find out just how solid um, Canelo's chin is by, by taking on the, the undoubtedly the hardest hitter up there. Um, yeah, I think it's got all the makings of a of a great fight, and the question is, is it a step too far? I think I think absolutely not. Does that mean Canelo definitely wins? No, but but absolutely not too far. 
Yeah, I think we're all in agreement there. Um, that wraps up our sort of Canelo section of the Q&A. If you have any more questions um, regarding Canelo or anything, me and Charlie do the question of the week on the podcast. So still send in some questions if you have them and we'll try and get through them on there as well. Next up, we're going into the USIC, USIC section. Um, and first up is number question four is how does a heavyweight of USIC size beat the likes of Joshua Fury and Wilder? So Charlie, you're up first on this one. I am um, sorry I realized I was on mute Um I I know who asked this question because funny enough they asked me um, around five or six months ago now um, the thing is and and the guy who asked it I think I think would happily admit he's, he's quite a casual fan and he he sees sort of just just the size difference and, and thinks well that just that's just mission impossible surely I mean I think I think most boxing fans would point to straight away u6 amateur fights you know with, in with people like Joe Joyce who who is the size of Joshua's and Furies and and how he dealt with them and and yeah the pro game's completely different but I feel we've already seen anyone who who looks back on U6 amateur career you've already seen U6 deal with the size and power of of much bigger guys than him he's been doing it for for most of his career so in terms of the size and power it doesn't necessarily worry me um I feel like uh, sorry, in terms of the power doesn't necessarily worry me. The size worries me a little bit going into it and, and I've never quite wanted to admit this about Usyk sort of being his one of his biggest fans and, and just always assuming that when he finally gets himself into these world title fights at heavyweight, he will he will eventually find a find a way to to unlock it and win it. Um but in the pro game, the 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 size advantage really does play a massive part and and what fighters certainly in heavyweight as well are allowed to get away with and and how long they're allowed to lock up for and and how long they're allowed to sort of lean on and 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 I'm, I I think I think certainly Tyson Fury would 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 massively play that game against Usyk I've always wondered did Joshua would Joshua have the necessary the boxing IQ to be able to do that or would he just see Usyk as a smaller man and therefore fancy himself in taking him out it's why I've always felt um Usyk had a better chance against Joshua than than Fury, but I think the question was how how does he beat the bigger men? Um, he beats the bigger men by by not necessarily changing too much about about himself. You know, he's he's certainly this would be the smartest boxer going in there, and um, and yeah, for me, Usyk's proved already in his in his in his certainly in his amateur career that that he can beat the bigger men, and 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 that wouldn't necessarily change for me against Joshua maybe maybe too much against Fury just where I feel he would use the size to his advantage yeah I completely agree and um, Billy you're up next what are your thoughts on it how does you sit go about beating the, the sort of big three as they're known yeah uh, well I'm a massive U6 fan but I don't think he stands a chance against Fury I think the, the height and reach advantage is so much in the way I think Fury, Fury just lean on him and knacker him out I don't think he stands a chance against Fury but I think he boxed his uh, rings around Wilder, to be honest. He's, he's obviously got to avoid Wilder's haymakers. But I think if he does that, he could ease to a point of decision over Wilder. Whereas Joshua, I think he could just use angles, use his angles and footwork. I mean, same problem with Wilder. He's got to avoid Joshua's big punches, the uppercut. And I think that would be pretty much 50-50 fight at Joshua and Yusuf. But... Um, yeah, I think he's got a good chance against Wilder and Joshua, but not much chance at all against Fury. Yeah, what about you, Michael? Yeah, I mean, echo much to what, what the other boys have said, you know, big Usyk fan. I think what made him so good at cruiserweight was obviously his speed, his footwork, his punch output as well was, uh, was ridiculous. I think in what in the World Series final, it was like, what, 1,000 punches for a guy that big? I mean, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But I think that's, the you know, I wouldn't change too much of, Usyk from the cruiserweights, to be honest with you. I mean, to win against Joshua, he's going to need, you know, the footwork mm. and, and the high punch output. I mean, I think, you know, if he could maintain those levels, I mean, absolutely, he could definitely win. Like I say, I think the Fury fight is a bit, well, I wouldn't say boring, but I mean, it's the less appealing attraction to watch. But like Billy, I, I think Fury probably is a bit too, uh, bit too uh, big. Yeah, with the dimensions for, for Usyk to, to, to come through that one. But yeah, Wilder, I mean, 
he probably box his ears off as long as he don't get caught with a big right hand. But I, I wouldn't change too much for Vucic's uh, cruiserweight career. I'd just sort of, you know, bring that into the heavyweights. And I think that's probably how he would, you know, beat them or, or you know, give them a good run for their money. Yeah, you make a good point about his, his sort of cruiserweight style. But even his amateur style against the bigger guys, he was never on the back foot and just picking them off. He always took it to the big guys. You watch the Joyce fight. Joyce was the one on the back foot just being put under all the pressure. Um, and I think Usyk would do that against the bigger guys. The question sort of a little bit about how does he beat people of that size. Usyk's the most technically skilled heavyweight out there. Um, so that is literally all he can really use to his advantage against them. You've got Wilder, who's not technically skilled at all, but obviously has the biggest punch of them. Um, so I think that what that's what makes that fight the easiest for him. Um, AJ is a little bit more technically skilled, but Usyk's still superior. And I don't think if Usyk does box him, I don't think you see Usyk on the back foot just looking to avoid AJ's punches. I think you see him a bit like a Bellew performance where you keep him on, you get him on the back foot, you make him feel uncomfortable and you tire him out a little bit. And I think um, that's the way to go about beating Joshua. I don't think it's just avoiding those combinations and uppercuts. I think you have to take the fight to him a little bit. Um, and then Fury, yeah, like you say, the reason I find that the hardest fight for him is because that technical skill that I'm talking about, the gap between him and Fury isn't as significant as him and the other two. Um, so I think that's that's why it's the toughest fight. Obviously, Fury is actually the biggest of the three as well. He's six foot nine. And Fury's just so awkward and can box in different styles and adapt it if he needs to. So that's what makes it a little bit difficult. And I think he, Usyk struggles against him, one, obviously, with the size, but two, just to find a way to constantly get going. Um, if Fury adapts his approach and if Fury's just being awkward and using his size, I think Usyk finds it hard to get going. But I think against the lesser skilled guys in Joshua and Wilder, I think he just simply has to use his skill, has to try and make them think harder than they've had to think before and just knacker them out, basically. I think that's their only sort of chance. Um, our next question about Usyk is... It looks like AJ is going to be vacating the WBO to make the Fury fight. But the question is, if AJ does vacate, vacate and you could choose one fighter to make the most interesting vacant fight for Usyk, who would it be and why? So first up is Michael. Um, I would probably go with, I think, Deontay Wilder, obviously in the realm of fantasy matchmaking. Um, I think, you know, it's obviously winnable. We, we you know, we've all just said, I think, uh, Wilder. Is probably the most winnable of the three due to his, you know, boxing technique and skill. Uh, it's a big name, and you know, maybe Usyk gets tested. I mean, that going into the Chisora fight, everyone was like, you know, how will Usyk take the power and all the rest of it? I mean, Chisora didn't really land too cleanly, so we didn't really get that answer. I mean, Chisora had his moments, but either or why the twelve rounds, it was pretty much Usyk's fight. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd probably go with Deontay Wilder just based on, you know, the biggest name, the winnable. Um, but, yeah, I mean, obviously that's, that's fantasy matchmaking, to be honest with you. Yeah, I actually agree with that. Um, I was looking at the WBO rankings um, and they're saying that when Parker fights far in February, that Parker will be made the mandatory instead of Joyce. Um but neither of them two interest me. The thing I really struggle with is I think any heavyweight that's the same height as Usyk or an inch or two sort of bigger just stands no real chance against him. So when you look at those rankings, there's Ruiz, there's Pulev, there's Parker, and none of them particularly interest me. There's Frank Sanchez as well, but that doesn't really interest me either. Michael Hunter's improved since Cruiserweight and gave um, Usyk a couple of hard rounds early on in their fight. So maybe that... Um, there's Hergovic up there as well. You're just going to sort of get a big lump, just try and knock him out for 12, which could make it interesting to see how Usyk deals with that. So for me, it's it's one of the big boys. Get a Hergovic in there, get a Wilder in there, someone that's just going to try and knock him out um, and use their size on him. I don't really want to see Usyk in a fight with someone that's his size because I think it's a little bit too easy. So um, my pick would be a Wilder or a Hergovic, someone like that. Billy, you're up next. What fight would you like to see? Um I've I've gone for Hunter. <laughs> um, like you just said, uh, he won a couple of rounds off him in the last fight, and I was looking up, and he had a, a third, I think it was a thirteen month layoff before that last fight with Usyk at Cruiser, and we all know Hunter's uh, come on a lot since then. Whereas Usyk, as much as we all love him, he's not necessarily impressed at heavyweight so far, and I think um, Hunter's a bogeyman, isn't he? Nobody wants to fight him. Uh, he's willing to fight anyone. 
And I think he'd go, give a good account of himself, whether he'd win or not. He probably won't, like you say, Jamie, he's probably too small. But um, I think he'd, he'd be closer fight than a lot of people think on on music. Yeah, I think it'd be a good fight. What about you, Charlie? Uh, yeah, I I think I think mine's probably be Deontay Wilder. I feel like it would be the perfect the perfect fight for Usyk to go up to, look good, finally be taken properly serious at heavyweight with that name on his on his sort of resume and before before targeting the winner of Joshua Fury. I, I guess two fights down down the road if they're having two fights. But yeah, I feel like I feel like Wilder is sort of. Um, in both his both his sort of standing in in heavyweight boxing, but also also him as a fighter, I think is perfect for Usyk right now. You know, Usyk needs needs those big fights at, at heavyweight. He's had he's had the sort of door opening fights of, of um, Chisora now, and and I don't really particularly want to see Usyk in with too many more other than the absolute elite. And I feel like Deontay Wilder. I always had Deontay Wilder just below Joshua and Fury. Anyway, I feel like he's the perfect, the perfect gatekeeper in a way to them two. Um, and if he can come through him, it'll be be really interesting as well to see Usyk take some of Wilder's power and not just beat him for twelve rounds and not lay a glove on him. I'd quite like to see Wilder land and just see just see how he deals with it because I feel if he does deal with it, it will it will really make certainly Joshua sit up and and realize that. Um, if he ever gets in the ring with him, the, the sort of big one bomb won't necessarily take him out. Fury, you know, not so much as he doesn't really rely on that anyway. But yeah, I feel like I feel like Wilder would be the perfect sort of gatekeeper to those to those top two. Yeah, it sounds like we're all in agreement then that it should be Wilder. The next question is along the lines of AJ Fury. Um, and it's if AJ versus Fury for the undisputed in front of 90,000 at Wembley or whatever the full capacity is. Um, so that's all the belts on the line, sort of biggest British fight of all time. Or you could have over in the States, you could have uh, Errol Spence against Terence Crawford. If you could only pick one or the other, what would you pick? Um, Billy, you're up for first for this one. Which one would you choose? Uh, as much as I'd all love to see Fury Josh around, going with Spence Crawford. Uh, I just love to see Spence Crawford. Both of them have never looked like getting beat, have they? Let's be honest. I mean, Spence had that toughish fight with Porter, but he never looked like getting beat, really. Uh, two elite fighters, and you're going back to the throwback days of the Hagler, Hearns, Ray Leonard. You're going back to the Four Kings days, aren't you? I mean, Crawford could probably mix it with them. It's, I don't think it's too far a shout to say that. And um, like I said, I just think I've just got a nagging feeling that Spence don't want it. I mean, I think Crawford would be willing to do it tomorrow, but Spence don't. He's, he's angling for more money, saying he wants a bigger percentage. It should just be 50 50. They've both got the belts, they've both got un- undefeated records. They're both world class. Just get it on, stop stop messing about and get it on. But like I said, I've just got a feeling Spence don't want it. He won't be mentioning the Canelo fight otherwise. Why is he mentioning Canelo? He shouldn't. He should just be. He should just have, maybe have a fight earlier in the year, and then get it on for the summer. But like I say, I've got nagging doubts that it's not going to happen. Yeah. What about you, Charlie? Which one would you go for? Yeah, I understand the way the question's been asked. That that um, it's not just what fight would you rather see more because because I think I'm with Billy. I'd rather see. I'd rather see the Spence. Um, um, Crawford fight if everything was sort of level, but I would go Joshua Fury just on the simple, the simple sort of fact of of what it would do in this country and and the city, the London itself. You know, just the whole. It would remind me so much of that Frotch Groves two build up of just just there just being a serious serious buzz around it. I mean, not to not to in any way link it into football because I know not everyone's into football but the Euros would be around the corner as well and the summer would be coming after everything that we've sort of gone through over the last nine months hopefully we'd be in in this hypothetical scenario we'd have 90,000 at Wembley which would suggest that we'd come through this pandemic and stuff and I just feel like that sort of buzz around that just the 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 enormity of it all um and and sort of knowing 
a day I would build with mates and, and stuff. And, you know, it's starting probably 11 o'clock in the morning um, and then and just going all the way through and just the excitement and the build up uh, rather than Spence Crawford, which would just be something that I would sort of set my alarm for and watch on my own and, you know, on an iPad or something, just, just, just to not miss that fight. Um, also, I would say, I know this isn't part of the question, but I'm, I'm 90% sure now that Joshua Fury happens next year and probably only at about 10 or 15% sure that Crawford Spence happens next year. I've got, I've got no belief as Billy says, there's just so much talk of other fights for the pair of them and, and there just doesn't seem to be this real, real push for it. Uh, maybe it will happen out of nowhere, but I would not be surprised to be sitting here this time next year and we still haven't seen Spence Crawford. Yeah, me neither. Michael, what are you going for? Charlie's uh, sale pitch sales pitch for uh, <laughs> Fury Joshua might have swung you there. Yeah, yeah. It, it actually has, to be honest with you. He should be on Dragon's Den with a pitch like that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean... And initially, my thoughts are Spence Crawford, um, for some of the reasons Billy said. Two elite guys, both undefeated, top 10, pound for pound, comfortably. Um, but then Charlie's come in and, you know, so, you know, gave her the pitch of the, you know, the, the, the pre-fight build-up of Fury AJ, which, you know, obviously, it doesn't need selling, does it? Let's be honest. Um, it would be undoubtedly the greatest British fight of all time, and the biggest, and all of the rest of the records that would go with it. Um but, I don't know, something about Spence Crawford, I mean, it's kind of turning into Mayweather Pacquiao now, isn't it, where it isn't going to happen. Is it, is, you know, there's too much politics and people involved. And like Billy said, I don't, I'm not 100% sure Spence actually wants it. He's, you know, banging on about Canelo. Um, but, yeah, no, I think I'm actually going to stick with Spence Crawford just because <laughs> uh, they're, un they're both unbeaten and they're, uh, you know, top 10 pound for pound. So, you know, I, I think as a... As a spectacle, AJ Fury is the bigger spectacle, but in terms of, a, of a, a boxing contest and a match, I think Spence Crawford takes it for me. Yeah, I think Charlie was right about how the question's been worded. It's uh, If you're just going for a fight, I think we'd all pick Spence Crawford, but it's yeah. it's an event and a build-up, and that sort of comes into play that Fury Joshua is just going to be huge. Um, even thinking just selfishly for the neutral corner, what it would do sort of like performance wise for us, you just know that it would do leaps and bounds beyond Spence Crawford um, and just the size of it. For me personally, I'm not even sort of around the Frotch Groves time. I'm not completely sort of bothered by all the hype and sort of making a day of it and things like that. Like I personally would rather get up in the early hours to watch a big fight. If I think of my excitement for like a Loma Lopez type fight compared to a big British fight, it's definitely much higher for those overseas fights. So I think I would personally pick Brent Crawford. Um, but in terms of an event, I don't think you can beat Fury Joshua. I think it'll be the biggest boxing event of sort of the past however many years. Um, Next up, and it's barring Joshua Fury, this question. So if Joshua Fury doesn't happen, or even just if it does happen outside of it, what is the best British fight that can be made next year? You're up first on this one, Michael. Um, I was torn between uh, Josh Kelly and Conor Ben. Um, I know Kelly's got to come through over the SEN in January, which is not an easy fight. Um, so Conor Ben may be sort of seen as a step down um, in, in level of competition. But I think once the, by the time Eddie sold it to us, you know, it, it does become a big, massive event between, you know, two unbeaten welterweights, um, you know, and there's a bit of needle there already. So it doesn't really overly need selling. And I think, you know, I think it would be a, a pretty good fight. They're both round about the same level, you know, both sort of, you know, 16 and over around that time. So I think that'll be probably the, best all British fight to make other than uh, AJ Fury for me personally. Yeah, you're up next, Billy. What one would you go for? Uh, yeah, I've gone for Callum Johnson, Josh Boatze. Uh, I think that's a cracking fight. Um, I don't think it'd go the distance either. I think someone's getting blown out there in the middle rounds. Um, I like Boatze, but it won't convince in his last fight against Kalich. He looks wobbly and he looked beatable and the only problem is Johnson himself. He's had nearly a two-year layoff since he knocked out um, Shawnee Monaghan in New York, I think it was. So he's going to have ring rust. So they might have a tune-up uh, in a couple of months and then decide to get it on in the summer. But I think I'd fancy Johnson for that. I think one of them's going between six and eight. And I, 
I think Johnson could knock him out. Yeah, that's a nice fight. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But Charlie, which fight would you go for? Yeah, my mine's around that light heavy division as well. I feel there's I feel there's loads of good fights to make there. I asked the other day, I asked you guys about um, Boatsy uh, Boatsy Smith and how everyone saw that going, and and I think that was my first sort of choice, knowing that there's no chance it gets made. I don't see Smith sort of going back to that level, um, even if he does move up. I would quite like to see it just out of my own interest, but but one that sort of would have been. I guess in everyone's this time last year was was Boatsy Yard. So so now I've sort of gone for Boatsy Arthur just just because I feel like I feel like Arthur's not even nearly got enough credit for for his performance against Yard and and as much as I wanted to see Boatsy Yard and I know Yard brings sort of power and stuff and that's why there was such an interest around Boatsy Yard and could he could he sort of get rid of him with that power and and Arthur won't necessarily do that but. I, I, I see no reason why why Arthur couldn't sort of upset the the apple cart again a little bit and and go and go and beat Boatsy as well. You know, I feel I feel he sort of box yards head off at times with with just with just a one hand, um, and I'd quite like to see him with two in with Boatsy. So I think that's my my choice. But a, a little shout out to to Fowler Fitzgerald too, just because it would be hilarious to see Fowler get beat by him again. Yeah, I um. So you all sort of covered the weight classes. When this question came in, I was thinking about what fights could be made because it's a little bit of a tougher question um, because the first one that came to mind was down at World Weight. You've got Kelly and Ben. Because um, for me, I kind of see them at a little bit of sort of different levels and I don't see it as quite as good matchup. But say Kelly doesn't look great against Avenici and he scrapes it or even he loses and the fight somehow comes about. Maybe the interest is a little bit more there, but light heavyweight stood out. Um, my pick was with Billy. Um, I went for Johnson versus Boatsy because um, I think it's one of those ones where if Boatsy isn't at 100%, it's where he can come unstuck. Um, so that was one of my ones. And then like Charlie just said, I also looked at light middleweight. Um, I was thinking about boxers this year that were sort of kind of done well for themselves and I was thinking about Kieran Conway the other week and just thinking about sort of how busy that division is they're talking about obviously uh, Fowler against Metcalf um, for the British title this year Fitzgerald's going to come back at some point hopefully so I think any mix of them I haven't actually picked a specific fight between them but I think a fight between any of them would be good you know Sam getting um, sorry not Sam getting Ted Cheeseman um, obviously getting the win last year and showed a bit of a different side to his game and looked a little bit refreshed. I think he's going to be in a good fight no matter who it's against. Um, so I think there's a good mix at light middleweight. I think there could be a good fight down there. But my my actual pick would be Boatsy Johnson up at light heavyweight. Now, the next question is the one when I uh, showed the questions to the guys. They all sort of uh, didn't really know where to go. And uh, this one is uh, Tia Fimo versus Tank. We mentioned it in our uh, 2021 uh, fights for next year and uh, basically been asked how do we see it going so Charlie you're up first on this one how do you see it going I know you're a Tank Davis fan and a Lopez fan so quite interested yeah um, <laughs> without sitting on the the fence a bit I, I don't know I don't know how I see it going I feel that's that's sort of what makes it such an interesting matchup I feel like I feel like Lopez probably deserves um to go in as the favourite after his after his performance against Lomachenko, and he currently is the man. Um, and I don't I don't think we know quite enough about Davis up at up at lightweight just yet um, for for us to be completely sold that that he can go up and and beat the man who's just beat the man basically. Um, so I feel I feel Lopez certainly goes in as favourite, um, and and both sort of carry power and, and both will both will, will will sort of back their own power up there um but lopez's performance against lomachenko and showing that he can he can not only blast people out and but can also can also box and as i've sort of alluded to before on on the last show we done the, the the 12th round from lopez when all the pressure was on him to still pull that out the bag that performance in that 12th round to to sort of seal his victory against Vasil lomachenko um, has really, really made me buy into to Tio and and yeah, I I go with Lopez on points just. Okay, well I'm going to Michael now because I know I think he struggled the most with the question, so I want to get his answer. Uh, yeah, so I went with Charlie in the end. Uh, I think Lopez does it. 
I think uh, he showed in the Loma fight. He can jab up to the head, up to the body. Um, he's a big 135. I know uh, size isn't obviously everything all the time. But yeah, um, alluding to Tank up at 135, we've only seen him against uh, Gamboa. And let's be honest, Gamboa was on one leg and it took him 12 rounds to get him out. So, you know, that's not a not a great form book for me. But then Davis is talented as well. So, <laughs> It's a tough one, but I think I'm going to go with Lopez. What about you, Billy? Uh, can I sit on my fence? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't got a club. Uh, you've maybe got to wedge with Lopez with his uh, obvious advantages, but I, had a, I just got a soft spot for Davis. You can never write him off. I mean, I've got a feeling as well it could maybe be a battle of the trainers, uh, Calvin Ford and uh, Lopez Senior. There could be a few man games going on in the lead up to it. But in the fight itself, maybe maybe Davis is just a bit too small, but he has got that equaliser, hasn't he? And I think, I don't know, to be honest. I'm, maybe Lopez edges it, but I won't, I won't be safe with any confidence. Yeah, uh, Usman might want to shut off at this point because I'm going to uh, not go in, in his favour. I remember when I, I put this in the chat, I think it was after Davis's knockout, um, and there were a couple of picks for Tank. And I think Lopez wins it a little bit easier than sort of being on the fence. Um, I just think Davis is smaller than Loma. Um, obviously not so much in sort of natural build, but in height, um, in reach and things like that, he's a little bit smaller than Loma. And just how much Loma struggled to get into position against um, Lopez. And this is one of the best pressure fighters ever you know, Olympic, two-time Olympic gold medalist, one of the best boxers ever. And he just simply couldn't get in the positions to, to land consistently enough on Lopez. Um, and I just feel like it's the same for, for Davis, the smaller man. I just don't feel like he gets in the positions. If Loma couldn't get in those positions, I don't think Davis is good enough to. I think he has obviously the equaliser and the power. Um, but I don't. I just don't think he gets in the in good enough positions to consistently land those shots or land it cleanly. I think I think Lopez uses his size, and pretty much just does what he did against Loma and boxes his way to a decision. Um, and Lopez is gonna is gonna hit Davis, and we've not really seen how Davis sort of reacts to being hit cleanly by a big puncher. Um, Lopez at lightweight is a is a bit of a sort of beast. He shouldn't be at that weight really. Um, and when he hits Davis, it'll be interesting to see how he reacts. I think a lot of people will put Tank as the power puncher in that fight, but up at lightweight, I have Lopez as the power puncher. I think he's the better boxer, um, and I think he'd win the decision a little bit more comfortably than than people would expect. So uh, sorry, Usman, for that one. Um, next up. We are going into down at Bantamweight and we're looking at Inoue, another pound-for-pound pound star. And the question was, who has the best chance of beating Inoue? This was sent in by a friend of mine, actually. Um, and Charlie, you're up first on this one. Who do you think stands the best chance? So the question wasn't necessarily for the weight he's at. And I read that as, or at least I took it as, how far up does, does Inoue have to go until someone beats him I could be wrong but just because it wasn't his weight necessarily in the question I was I was having a look at at just sort of how high up he has to go um and 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 still I can't I can't answer with any confidence I have I have grown recently into really wanting to see him in with uh Rigondeau I don't know I don't know how much Rigo's got left um but I, I do still feel there's there's a kind of elephant in the room there a little bit of of a new a sort of dealing with everyone relative ease. Um, I know the Donaire fight sort of aside, but but even in that fight I never I never really thought Inoue was in too much trouble. Um and and yeah, I th- I feel like Rigo, his whole career has almost been ignored and and avoided and and even now, even a really aged Rigo, it's just easy for for these fighters to to almost brush him to one side and 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 not have to even even deal with the challenge of him anymore. So, so first of all, I'd like to see that fight still. I'd like to see an Rigo, whether or not we see it or not is another thing. Um, and I'd find, you know, going into that and, and the build up to it and stuff, I feel like, um, and we'd certainly have it in our sweepstakes. I, I feel like I, I may end up siding with Rigo. Um, now, whether or not he's, he's the correct answer to this question, I'm not, I'm not too sure if that's just a slight bias, but 
I feel I feel if Inoue does deal with the whole division he's in now, he also does the same in the division above. And and I feel like he I feel like we don't see Inoue beat him for, for quite a while across these two divisions. Um Neri's a good fight, but but I'm not sure I'm not sure he has the discipline or or the, the, the will to really give give him a give him a challenge and then and then it's going all the way up to sort of the divisions of Warren and and um, can and, and fighters like that and, and I feel that that would be too much and they would be far too big and I wouldn't necessarily want to see a new way up there but without without sort of ducking the question I don't see anyone really within within the weight he's in and the weight above doing anything to a new way and the only one I really want to see um, even though I know he's he's sort of over the hill at this point is Rigo. Yep, yeah, you're up next, Billy. I know you're a big Inoue fan. How do you... Yeah, yeah I'm, uh, he's probably... Well, not probably. He's my favourite fighter. Uh, he has been for the last few years. And I don't see anyone getting anywhere near him. The only way he'll get beat is if he moves up too, too far. And even looking at Super Bantam, you've got Medliev and Vargas, fighters like that. They're, they're not going to beat him. I was thinking of the Neri fight. And I thought maybe Neri would stand a chance because it would just be a shootout. So it'd be like a two or three round shootout. So Neri maybe would stand a chance. All he'd have to do was connect with one of them shots. But like Charlie said, Neri's not disciplined. He's had weight problems in the past. Um, even like moving up to featherweight, you've got the Warringtons and the Kanzos and people like that. I, I don't think I know we'll end up at featherweight. It's not big enough. So no, I don't see him getting beaten. I could see him going and beating for rest of his career to be on big, big call, but. Yeah, I agree. What about you, Michael? Do you think he'll go and beat him? Um, yeah, I think size is the only thing that beats him in a way. Uh, at Bantam, I don't really see anybody that can stand up to his power. He's kind of got that Mike Tyson aura now where, you know, opponents are kind of fearful for that power before it's even landed. And, you know, a lot of them go into his shell early doors. I mean, Rodriguez just got blown away and so it's tough to see at Bantam where it happens. I mean, the Lewis Neri fight would be a fun fight, just two guys in the middle exchanging. But yeah, I mean, maybe if he was to move up to featherweight and Josh Warrington uh, with Warrington's punch output and his just relentless pressure and, and being the naturally bigger guy, maybe. Um, so yeah, that, that would probably be my pick, but I'm pretty much echoing what the other guys are saying, to be honest with you. So yeah, yeah. That, that would, size is the only thing that beats him, to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree. The, the person with the best chance of eating him is size. Um, featherweight is pretty, will sort of be his ceiling, I think. It'll be interesting to see if he ever does end up there. But I think at bantamweight, no one really stands a chance. Um, my thing with Inoue was wondering how he'd hold up in situations where he gets tagged with a big shot, how he holds up when he has to sort of go through any kind of adversity. And then in the Denair fight, it pretty much all happened at once. He obviously had like his orbital bone broken, um, he got tagged cleanly a couple of times by Donaire, who, although past his best, is one of the most fearsome punchers that those lower weights has ever seen. Um, and he just sort of swallowed it all up and sort of came through. And then he nearly forced a stoppage at the end. So I think at bantamweight, it's just he's going to wrap those belts up and then it will be pretty easy for him. I think it will be just as easy at super bantamweight. But I think there's there's more fun fights there. I don't feel like he blows some of them away as easily as he does at bantamweight. But he still beats them quite easily. I just mean that he doesn't sort of clean them out in a couple of rounds. The Akmad Liev fight is a brilliant fight. The Neri fight is also a brilliant fight. Um, it was the one we all wanted to see down at Bantamweight. I don't think Neri really stands a chance, to be honest. I know um, on that Charlo card, me and Billy were up watching it. And um, in that fight that he was in against that Alameda, uh, Eddie Reynoso was going mental at him between rounds because it just seemed like he didn't really want to be there. Um, so a little bit of strange fight in area, but yeah, I just don't think there's anyone that really troubles him at sort of 118 and 122. I think 126 is where you start to see his his sort of smaller size start to play an impact and people start having a chance. But I did think about the Rigo fight as well, but it kind of, I really, really don't want it to happen as a uh, as a Rigo fan. He looked, Rigo looked pretty awful in his last fight, in, in honesty. And um, yeah, kind of want to avoid that. But as one of those sort of take your pick um, fantasy fights of a prime Rigo, that's definitely a fight. But for now, I just don't see a new way losing. 
And uh, speaking of unbeatable fighters, we now move on to sort of a bit more of a, I say historical, but it's more just sort of going back in time and looking at past fighters. So this this next question is, was a prime Roy Jones unbeatable? If you ask us, man, I believe you'll say yes, but we're asking Billy first. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'm saying yes as well. Um, you just have to watch a few of his videos, don't you? I mean, similar to, a bit similar to Mayweather at 126 and Duran at lightweight. Yeah, I think in his pram, he was unbeatable. I mean, look at some of his performances. I mean, when he destroyed Mont Montel Griffin that second time, uh, knocked him out in the first round. Yeah, he's behind the back knockout against, was it Glenn Kelly? Yeah, Glenn Kelly. Um, some of his, his performance against Virgil Hill, the way he beat Hopkins, Tate, Pazienza, uh, beat Reggie Johnson. Just some of the some of his angles that he threw. Uh, I mean, when he threw a shot as well, he, he wanted to hurt you. I mean, he thought it were bad intentions. And obviously, he went on to, everyone knows he went on way too long. I mean, probably, I don't know, 10 years too long. But the way I, I, I always class him, uh, as an unbeaten fighter in my head because he just went on too long. And he was outstanding, wasn't he, really? I mean, I don't love Roy Jones as much as other people do, but Usman and others. But, yeah, it's definitely, I think he was unbeatable in this program. Yeah, I'm next up in the list, so I'll talk about it quickly. But, yeah, I think the him at super middleweight and his first sort of um, pomp at light heavyweight, he was he was unbeatable. The thing with him was it wasn't just his ability, it was the natural athleticism. Um, not a lot of fighters are blessed with that. You get the occasional ones, you kind of get the Floyds and the Pennell Whitakers of this world that are just sort of beasts, of, sort of just athletically. Um, with skill, elite skill combined on top of it just makes them so good. And I think when you look back at the super middleweight division, it's a bit of a light division sort of historically anyway. Um, but you look at outside of him as sort of the two greatest super middleweights in Andre Ward and Joe Kozaghi. I think a prior Ron Jones beats him pretty easily. If you put him up at light heavyweight against sort of any light heavyweight throughout history, there's some that can trouble him, you know, if, if Bob Foster hits him cleanly, if Michael Spinks can give him problems, Michael Spinks is a bad matchup for any light heavyweight, but I just do think that that, that level of athleticism, the natural speed, the reflexes, the power, just everything coming together just made him unbeatable at that weight. And like you say, one of very few unbeatable fighters, I think, you're saying about sort of Mayweather, I think Mayweather at 130 can be considered it, I think, uh, you know, Ricardo Lopez down at um, minimum weight as well can be considered it. Pennell for a time, Duran for a time. I think there's just some fighters that were just, if they were at their best, beat anyone from any era. And I think Roy Jones was that at super middleweight and his first stint at light heavyweight. What about you, Charlie? Do you agree with me and Billy? Yeah, I think I think in terms of you know the the, the sort of term I'm unbeatable, you know, in, in in boxing, at the end of the day, you're punching each other in the face, and 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 things can always go wrong. But but in terms of in terms of just that much better than than everyone else, he he simply was. And as Billy said, you only have to watch a few videos of Roy Jones Jr. just to appreciate. Um, just how good he was, and it, and it's always been a shame how long he went on because because there are simply fans, maybe not maybe not you know hardcore boxing fans, but but people who see himself as a as a sort of floating fan of the sport and will see a record and 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 decide there and then whether or not they think that person was was necessarily as good as they've made out and and his record annoyingly um, has has defeats on that you know, he should have had his feet up at home at that point. Um, for for my own sort of um, fanboyishness of Andre Ward, I'd have loved to have seen that prime for prime. But as you say, I, I feel that there would have been one eventual winner and that would have been Roy Jones Jr. So, so yeah, in terms of unbeatable, um, uh, in terms of like just, just that, that, that much better than, than everyone else, I, I absolutely think he was. And lastly, Michael, do you agree? Yeah, uh, Roy Jones is my favourite fighter of all time, so I'm going to be slightly biased for this one. Um, but yeah, I mean, the complete fighter, really. Power, speed, defence, had a lot. Um, 
I mean, he obviously went up, even went up to heavyweight. I mean, if he retires after the heavyweight, I mean, he's he's you know, I mean, he's considered you know one of the one of the greatest of all time. Anyway, I mean, if he retires after the heavyweight win, he probably you know finishes up a lot higher on a lot of lists. But you know, yeah, just echoing what the other guys are saying, really, just yeah, uh, uh, unbeatable in my opinion. But then again, it's a bit biased, so. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, now we're on to uh, question 11, and this one's a nice easy one. There's no sort of uh, right or wrong to this, and it's just your favourite heavyweight boxer of all time, someone wants to know. So, uh, Charlie, you're up first on this one. Yeah, so I always find it find it hard to have favourite fighters that wasn't necessarily from my era of watching boxing or you know, my lifetime, just because I can appreciate going back and watching fighters I weren't around for, but I... I Sometimes I have to feel invested in them, you know, and, and, and the, the build up to them and, and their, their lesser fights building into their bigger fights and, and just seeing the belief in their eyes. Whereas when I go back and watch fights, I find that a lot harder knowing, knowing the result beforehand. So I've kind of wiped out everyone before my time in terms of having a chance of being the best or my favorite heavyweight. And then, and then I started to think, I'm not a massive fan of heavyweight boxing, to be honest. It's never been. I mean, we've got Furies and Joshua's at the minute, and I'm not that bothered on either. Um, both both do stuff that I quite like, and both do stuff that irritate me a lot. And and there are sort of obvious too. And um, and yeah, so the, there's there was no one really that stood out. And then I thought, well, the one that probably stood out, and the one that was around in my childhood that was just so impressive of you know, sort of carrying all the belts and I was at a time where I didn't necessarily understand boxing. I just sort of understood that you had to knock the other guy out and, and be big and strong. And, and that's Lennox Lewis. You know, he was just, uh, I don't know why I've called him Lennox Lewis. It's definitely Lewis. But yeah, he he was sort of, he was the the man in Britain at that point. I know I've, I've gave my pitch on Prince Nazim a few times and he was certainly the man that got me into boxing. But Lewis, with all his is sort of belts and and just what seemed at the time like constant wins was was definitely the man who who made me appreciate heavyweight boxing um and yeah Lennox Lewis basically Michael what about you uh I've gone for a bit of an obvious choice I've gone with Mike Tyson uh simply because he was kind of like the first vague memory of boxing uh I remember my old man sending me around my nan so she could look after me during Tyson Bruno. So I imagine he was probably, you know, on the beers with his pals. And then afterwards me asking for the result, you know, what happened. And then I was mad into WWF as a kid. And he had that period where he was with Stone Cold and Degeneration X and all of that lot. And then going into it, he had the Lennox Lewis fight. So like Tyson was always sort of a, a, a constant there. And then obviously as I get more into boxing and look back and, you know, you just look at the destructive nature of his early fights and it, yeah, it just yeah, it's got to be Mike Tyson for me personally. But you know, I can see the argument for Lennox Lewis. Although I don't know, I kind of like the character who's got a bit more about him. And, and Tyson certainly had that that character, the demeanour, the aura about him, which you know stands out to me personally. Yeah, someone had to pick Mike Tyson. Um, <laughs> Billy, what about you? Um, I had a soft spot for Lennox Lewis as well. Uh, like us say he was. When he started winning Brit his British title against um, Mason, I think it was going this, and that's when I I started getting into boxing. Really, I think it was about nineteen ninety. Um, so, but I've gone for George Foreman. He's my favourite heavyweight. Um, nasty one. He was a nasty man. Uh, intimidate along with Sonny Liston, probably the two most intimidating heavyweights that's ever been. I mean, his longevity as well, fighting from 69 to 94, yeah, 94, when he came back and won the world, world title. His, his first knockout over Joe Frazier, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest one-sided beatdowns you'll ever see, um, especially at that level, because Joe Frazier was up with his level. He was a top-tier fighter as well. I mean, he, he was only one of two men to stop George Chavala, one of the hardest men ever to fight. I think Frazier was the other one. And then he's, he's knocked a lot of men out. I mean, obviously got beat by Ali in the Rumble in the Jungle, but he's beat men like Juan Lyle, Peralta, Chuck Wetner. And then when he came back in 1990, a lot of people thought it was a bit of a freak show, really, didn't they? But he gave Holyfield a good fight. And then he looked pretty good against Jerry Coney and knocked him out. 
And then when he fought Michael Moore in '94, I thought it was an outstanding punch. Like I said, everyone thought it was a bit of a joke, really. And then it just wiped him out, didn't it? I can't remember what round it was, but it just wiped him out. And yeah, for fighting that long, having that longevity, he's my favourite fighter ever. Heavy, heavyweight fight, sorry. Yeah, one of the most devastating. Um, I'm glad no one took my pick, but my pick's uh, Joe Lewis, so a bit different to sort of Charlie's pick. My uh, As a kid, I remember sort of all the, the boxing books I had and going back and reading through them, and I remember Joe Lewis's face and Sonny Liston's face. They just always stood out to me. And when you go back and read about these guys and sort of just watching Joe Lewis, just what, what a sort of beautiful fighter he was. One of those fighters that didn't waste a single shot through every punch with like the perfect textbook technique. Um, and he's one of the very few fighters from around that era where you put them in future eras and they, they, they win, they sort of hold their own and they come out on top and top in some of their matchups. Um, there's a lot of fighters from back then where we sort of remember them as great, but you put them in the, the later eras and they simply don't compete. Um, but Joe Lewis wasn't one of them, although he'd be a lot smaller and he'd probably be a cruiserweight and maybe even a light heavyweight with, with his size. Um, but just a beautiful fighter that just threw everything for a reason, didn't waste a shot, beautiful technique um, and just sort of was a hero in America. He was a really good fighter um, and I just love sort of going back and watching him and reading about him. Um, some of his knockouts, just like, even when he destroyed Schmelin in a round after all that happened going on with World War Two and getting upset by him in the first fight, which no one expected, and then come back and just destroying him in 90 seconds or whatever it was. It was just, just an amazing fighter to read about. And yeah, my favourite heavyweight of all time. And now the last question, and a bit of a warning, we don't want to offend anyone with this question, um, but someone sent it in and it made me laugh, so I thought I'd do it. Um, and this one is, who's the worst world champion you've seen in your lifetime? So I thought I'd start off. The first one that came to mind was Charles Martin. And I know he's on some kind of like decent sort of return at the minute. Um, but just when you saw him in the ring with AJ, even in the build up, the way he came to the ring with like the crown on his head and everything, you just knew he was going to be pony. And then it showed on the night as well. Um, so he stands out. And then I was trying to think of like blatant other ones and then I thought of like a, a kind of time period for British boxing and sort of around sort of 2012 to 2016 at Bantamweight there was that weird era where the IBF belt went from Stuart Hall to Paul Butler to Lee Haskins um, and that's three British world champions who to be honest in any other time period wouldn't have been a world champion um, Paul Butler, not a bad fighter by any means. Lee Haskins was quite awkward, but like Stuart Hall, for example, I don't think he's anything more than a British level fighter. Um, so not necessarily the worst world champions, but just that time period for, for British boxing was a bit strange um, that all three of them became world champion. We've got uh, Michael next up. What about you? Yeah, no, I went with uh, Prince Charles Martin, who uh, walks this earth like a god. I mean, what did he? He won the title against a, an opponent who had a freak leg injury and then, you know, talked the big and come over wearing that crown and lasted about three and a half minutes. Never to be seen again, is he? I, I don't even know. I mean, I read somewhere he was IBF mandatory again or something like that. Ridiculous. But I mean, yeah, nah. Charles Martin for me all day. Yeah, pretty awful. Billy, what about you? Uh, I've got a few on the list here. I mean, Charles Martin's obviously on it. I mean, he's got to be on it. I mean, but, um, <laughs> I've got a couple of Hatton opponents, Juan Arango and Carlos Mauda. God knows how they became world champion, but they did. Uh, Michael Bento knocked out Tommy Morrison in the round. I think he had one more fight after that, and I think it was Herbie Hard, and then he retired. Um, Saddam Ali, he'll beat Cotto um, when Cotto was way past it. We've got Andreas Kotelnik. Um, but I've gone with a um, pretty vague one, really. I've gone with Luis Santana. He was a light middleweight in the mid 1990s. He beat um, terrible Terry Norris, but he only got the belt by a disqualification. And then they had a rematch. They actually had a trilogy. In the second fight, Norris, sorry, in the first fight, Norris hit him with a rabbit punch, so he got the belt. In the second fight, Norris got disqualified again to hit him after the belt. And in the third fight, Norris wiped him out in a couple of rounds. And then this Louis Santana, I think he was from Dominican Republic. He got beat 17 or 18 times out of 30 fights. And 
he's probably one of the rubbish world champions I've ever seen. No offence. <laughs> Yeah, that's a pretty poor one. Charlie, you've got a list to choose from there or you've got your own. What are you going for? Yeah, so so my immediate sort of thought when I read the question was was certainly Charles Martin and I thought maybe it's a bit cop-out-ish and I should think more into it, but I was quite glad that everyone mentioned him. It didn't make me feel bad. Um, but yeah, I, I, feel like, I feel like he is the sort of stereotypical, obvious pick now. Um, and it did have me thinking about Maybe not not necessarily the worst, but there's there's been a few sort of how on earth did that guy become a world champion? And um, maybe from from earlier fights, watching them and just thinking they were they were never going to go on to to sort of world honors. I mean, the sort of three you mentioned in Hall Butler and Haskins was was something. I mean, Lee Haskins was not only a world champion; he was started to be talked about. I remember him defending his title one. I think it was actually the night he lost it. And they were talking about him like as this, as maybe Britain's best world champion. And it was just a really weird time, but, but also a name. And I feel quite bad for saying this really, because by all accounts, he is, he is the good guy of boxing, but how Anthony Crollo ever ended up as world champion, I will never know. I mean, if you go back to sort of his Derry Matthews fights and he just looked a million miles away and, and, and looked a million miles away from, from world, world title honors throughout his whole career and then just went on a ridiculous run and, and fair play to him he didn't he didn't get any sort of dodgy decisions to win world titles he won them fair and square but but yeah it, it I still look back on on that run and just think where on earth did that come yeah I think that with um with Crowder as well there was a, that lightweight time was also similar to that bantamweight time that I was talking about where it was just really weird and it was just a load of Brits fighting each other. Um, but that wraps up our Q&A. Thanks for joining me, guys. Really enjoyed it. Hopefully get uh, Michael and Billy back on. Um, me and Charlie are going to be recording a Campbell vs. Garcia preview podcast today. Um, so go and check that out because this that will be out by the time you guys see this on New Year's Eve. Um, remember to subscribe to the channel and any of the audio platforms um, we're ne nearing our goal of 100 subscribers so help us reach it thanks for listening we wish you all a happy new year and we'll catch you in 2021 cheers everyone <laughs>